when we were writing the scraps, we had a sense that we probably wanted to use some of those great songs that are in there. And it becomes hard to imagine telling the scene of 13 Dwarfs squashed into Bilbo's little dining room without doing Blunt the Knives. And then he says, did you hear that, lads? He's, he just says, well, Blunt the Knives. Tolkien is showing you your first glimpse of Dwarvish culture, and he's also showing you how well they work as a unit. Off they went, not waiting for trays, balancing columns of plates, each with a bottle on the top, with one hand, while the hobbit ran after them, almost squeaking with fright. Please be careful and please don't trouble, I can manage. But the dwarves only started to sing. Blunt the knives, bend the forks. Smash the bottles and burn the corks. And they start literally frisbeeing plates down the corridor and they're sort of really taking the mick out of Bilbo and they start to wind him up a bit. That's what Bilbo Baggins hates! But in the end, Tolkien uses this song to show that they know how to be civilized. Bilbo notices that even though they made a huge mess, they've cleaned up the place. <laughs> to come up with the music for Blunt the Knives, we turned to Steve Gallagher, who's one of our music editors, but is also a wonderful composer himself. Their instructions were that it was to be a rambunctious, almost like a pub sing-along. Send them down the hole to roll! One of the things that Fran suggested to me when I started writing Blunt the Knives was that I should definitely pay respect to Tolkien's words. She said, try rearranging some of them if you find them hard to scan or hard to place beats on. Blunt the knives and bend the forks, smash the bottles, burn the corks, chip the In the first verse here, Tolkien started with chip the glasses and crack the plates, blunt the knives and bend the forks. That's what Bilbo Baggins hates smash the bottles and burn the corks. We just swapped the two lines around, so they read, blunt the knives and bend the forks, smash the bottles and burn the corks, chip the glasses and crack the plates. That's what Bilbo Baggins hates. We left that in as the unison cry of the dwarves taunting him. That's what Bilbo Baggins hates! <laughs> Initially in the Blunt the Knives demo, there was an instrumental part in the book, each of the dwarves, when they enter Bilbo's house, have an instrument. So it shows you that the dwarves are very musical people. In the film version, we only have two. And at the time, I thought, well, I'll have to hire some musicians to play this. And Fran pulled me aside and said, you should ask Jimmy Nesbitt to play the tin flute solo. And Jimmy sort of thought for a minute, and he said, well, not very good. I'll bring my flute in, and we'll try it out. Oh, send them down the hall to roll. He just pulled it out of the bag and my jaw dropped open and went, fantastic, you're hired. I didn't know I was going to play the tin whistle and that's still in there. So that was exciting. One of the challenges was making the sounds of Dwellin's fiddle. It's like a little dwarf ukulele. Yeah, it's something that he could carry in his pack. Does it work? No. Can you give us a tune? I couldn't play anyways. Right. Like, I, I sort of did some research into Nordic music and the sounds of the hardang which is like a medieval violin, and it has a lower tuning than your standard concert violin. I couldn't find any of these instruments in New Zealand, but I decided that to make the fiddle sound, it would be nice to sort of combine some elements of two instruments. So we had a bowed banjo and this quite low tuned violin. and we laid that up with the bowed banjo, and that's what you hear in the film. Flash the wine on every door. It's almost like a music video, actually, this routine. And roll! I guess I can just mark this off as I've been in a semi-musical and then call it a day. One thing that Peter and Fran asked for was that the song was supported by the dwarves making rhythms and incorporating these sounds and, and the rhythm of these sounds into the piece. And so we went into the Foley room and we had four of us standing there, stomping away, trying to lock everything in time to that rhythm, whether it was a plate ting or a cutlery hit. A lot of fun actually just trying to make the sound effects really meld into that music.
is here. And then Thorin shows up and the mood changes. So the filmmakers really use these songs to introduce character as well as culture. And suddenly, first one and then another began to sing as they played, deep-throated singing of the dwarves in the deep places of their ancient homes. I always believed that it would be a song that had been passed on generation after generation so that you didn't forget what happened there. Far over the misty mountains cold. I think the Misty Mountain song is their history in, encapsulated. When I first heard it, I immediately brought to my mind, these are medieval Icelandic dwarves. The dwarves that Tolkien had in his mind that influenced him early on in his career. In fact, the names of the dwarves Tolkien took directly from the Poetic Eda, which is a, a group of medieval Norse sagas. I mean, we cut a little bit of later and the dwarves are uh, gathered staring at the fire, and Thorin begins to sing in a low voice. For over the misty mountains cold, to dungeons deep and caverns old, we must away ere break of day to find our long-forgotten gold. In The Hobbit, we were shooting the movie a long time before Howard Shaw worked on the score, and we needed the actors on set to be able to sing these songs. And so we turned to Plan 9, a wonderful group of musicians here in New Zealand, and we've often turned to Plan 9 to provide practical music that we need on set. If we have a party scene and we need dancing, or we need singing in a pub. But the only food for the brave and true come from the green dragon and they came up with the Misty Mountains tune. We knew that the Dwarven culture was one that they were great singers, you know. Something that everybody in the culture would do. I can imagine the Misty Mountain song being sort of sung in a cavern. You know, their miners and that song being sung in a large space would be beautiful. So it needed to have that simple shape. Quite a simple folk song, you know, like with sort of three or four chords. So we had a few different versions of that. How many demos did we give of Misty Mountain? Mm, six or eight. I think we did eight. Far over the misty yeah. mountains cold To dungeons deep and caverns old There was one that goes Far over the misty mountains cold where caverns deep and canyons are. <laughs> we must away a break of day to find our long forgotten gold. We didn't know which one they no. would want. <laughs> it's really interesting. You sort of send them off and you go, mm. <laughs> The pines were roaring on oh. I think what David Long and Plan 9 did with the Misty Mountain song is they combined the two tones that Howard Shore and The Lord of the Rings set out as the paradigms of dwarvish culture, musically speaking. You have the sound of these very minor, regretful harmonies in parts of Dwerdelf. And you have the male voices, which were associated with Moria. Chorus is the dwarf chorus. And they're singing in this ancient uh, dwarvish language. Combining those two tones is, is largely what results in the Misty Mountain song. You have a, a very minor moded tune uh, with male voices. To find our long, long forgotten gold. 
we were doing Richard Armitage's audition and he was just about to leave and I was looking down at some of my notes and I suddenly thought, oh, yeah, of course, Misty Mountains. And I said to him, can you sing? And he sort of went, well, yeah, which was really funny because that boy, can that guy sing? Far over the misty mountains cold Far over Wow, it comes out of nowhere. It's just, what a beautiful voice. I hate him. There is something religious about the sound, but it needed to be right from the gut, right from the core, not too much of a performance. It's very personal how these uh, voices are blending. Far over the misty mountains cold To dungeons deep It turns out that as an ensemble, we have a, a beautiful kind of resonant choir within. So is everyone good to shoot? Yes. Yeah. 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 Good. Towards the end of the song, I think it's good if Richard turns around and really connects with you guys. And then just as the song reaches its finale, you know, in the last um, verse or something, you can start to look up at Richard and, and that might draw the last couple of you to your feet. All right, well, let, let's give it a go, eh? Shoot. Yeah. 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 Ready? <coughs> Set. And playback. The pines were. really did feel a coming together feeling and while we were shooting that scene. It really sums up the atmosphere of uh, what's about to happen and where we're going to go on our journey. The trees like torches blazed with light. And then I guess it made sense that that song would become the theme of their quest. You actually get a lot of the Misty Mountain song in Howard Shore's score to the film. And I like the fact the score shows you these variations on that theme and gives you the sense that maybe what we hear in Bag End isn't the only way this song is ever sung. In those days of our tale, there were still some people who had both elves and heroes of the North for ancestors. And Elrond, the master of the house, was their chief. I wish I had time to tell you even a few of the tales or one or two of the songs that they heard in that house. Change the tune, why don't you? I feel like I'm at a funeral. Both his song at Rivendell is there for a purpose in the story. <coughs> There's a... And there's an end, there's a merry old end beneath an old grey hill. We wanted something that was an opportunity for the dwarves to really thumb their nose at the elves, you know, to be disrespectful. And having one of the dwarves jump up on the sacred plinth, oh. which is the same plinth that the one ring is put on <laughs> later on in the Lord of the Rings, um, and starts singing a pub song. The man in the moon himself came down one night and his fell. We just thought that's a great you know, device to show how the dwarves don't really have any respect whatsoever for the elves. So we then thought, OK, what can he sing? And it was a bit naughty of us. What we ended up doing was taking a song that Frodo sings when he's in The Prancing Pony. And we never got to use it in The Lord of the Rings. For a moment, Frodo stood gaping, 
Then, in desperation, he began a ridiculous song that Bilbo had been rather fond of, and indeed rather proud of, for he had made up the words himself. Tolkien was very interested in how songs and stories survived and how they might have been in previous cultures. So The Man in the Moon is Tolkien's prehistory of the Hey Diddle Diddle nursery rhyme. So the cat on the saddle played Hey Diddle Diddle, a chick that had waked the dead. It gives you a sense that maybe there's a link between modern day real world and the history of Middle Earth. It's interesting that in this particular version of The Hobbit, we have Bofur the dwarf singing it on a table similar to Frodo in The Lord of the Rings. And I praying alone. <laughs> So either Bilbo learnt it off Bofa or Bilbo had written it on the journey to Rivendell and taught it to Bofa. You decide. So you're going to be chorus master? Well, yeah, I mean, it's, hard, well, yeah. it's good because he knows the words really well. Jimmy came up with that tune himself. He did it all himself. Fran invited Jimmy to come over to our house and, 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 and to work up a tune. So anyway, I went home and I thought, what the hell am I going to do? You know, I'm not a songwriter, you know. But I showed it to Peggy, my eldest, and I said, I think it's kind of like a drinking type song, you know. She looked at the words and she said, you should have a kind of a beat in your head. And then it sort of came together. You know, I just sort of looked at it and went, there's an inn, there's an inn, there's a merry old inn. Underneath an old grey hill. And then that naturally goes, and there they brew a beer so bright. The man in the moon himself came down one night to drink his fill. I always remember having to play it to Peter on a Sunday afternoon, and we went into Peter's bedroom where he was drinking tea, watching rugby, whilst reading The Economist. There you have Peter Jackson. What makes a good pub song is something that people can join in with. And there they brew a beer so brown. Beneath the old grey hill. It's totally out of tune. It's not even close to the tune. It's just rubbish. The landlord should come round in the moon. It's, it's after, after three, he said. Like he... I think it'd be great if Dwalin just yelled the whole thing. Yep. So the cat oh, the oh, way, the oh, the oh, oh, the tipsy cat. They sort of just let you go with things. That's what I mean. That's what's weird about it. This massive, massive, you know, thing. But also they'll say, oh, yeah, you can write that song. Or if you come up with a tune, we'll record it. <laughs> they are <laughs> That's music. I think the fact that the villains have a song, too, says something about the pervasiveness of music in Middle Earth. The goblins began to sing, or croak keeping time with the flap of their flat feet on the stone and shaking their prisoners as well. The Down Down in Goblin Town song really gives you right away a peek into the identity of this people. And so we hear that the goblins like to crack and snap bones. In the book, you hear it before you meet the great goblin. In the film, it's really the great goblin introducing himself. I feel a song coming on. I'm very happy to say that my character has a song in this uh, movie. Pound, 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 pound. Catchy, isn't it? It's <clears throat> one of my own compositions. It's a hate-filled number, which uh, I think children will enjoy. And, uh, and senior citizens would appreciate. Clap, snap, the black crack. Grip, it's black entirely about destruction, death, and torture. But uh, I try to do it in a sympathetic way. Down, down to Goblin Town. <laughs> down, 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 Goblin Town was the catchphrase. It's a, it's a great, great line, and, and really lended itself quite well to sort of musical adaptation. They did play a recording of the composers singing it. Clap, snap, the black crack, grip, grab, pinch and nab. He sort of looked at it and listened to it, and then he looked up and he said, oh, no, this is all wrong. My character is tone deaf, and so I had to do what is an extremely difficult thing for a person like me who sings beautifully. I had to sing it badly. Pound, pound, far underground. 
He basically went through the lines and just said, well, I don't think the Goblin King would sing it like that. I think he'd sing it like this. And he was right. Flatterer. The song is kind of reverse engineered in a sense. His performance was the starting point. Yeah! And we based all of the instrumentation and all the harmony around his performance. Hmm, it's middle. It dings. It shall be Goblin. The sound designer Dave Whitehead and I set up a percussion orchestra in the ADR room at Park Road Post. Peter said that the goblins were scavengers and that they would gather bits and pieces from the world above. They're taking this junk that maybe other cultures would throw away and they're using it for actual useful and, in this case, musical ends. But some of the things we recorded were actually unlistenable. They were so sort of um, abrasive. So I do think you have to become a goblin to make goblin sounds. That's mine. <laughs> so once we got the percussion into a really good shape, we actually played it to Peter and uh, he said that he would like to have horns. <laughs> Dave Whitehead has made some amazing horns made from a combination of different things. Um, so we have a modified didgeridoo, modified with the classic uh, rubber glove and uh, children's noise maker. When we work on a film, we have to look at the space that the scene is set in. The goblin town is in a huge cave, and obviously the set wasn't a huge cave. And so we had a team go up to Waitomo Caves which is in the middle of the North Island. You know, it's the classic dripping cave with the stalactites and stalagmites. Four of the crew went up there to record what we call impulse responses of the cave. A sound that goes from low complete up to high. This is pretty much taking like a sound photograph of echoes and reverbs of a room. And so then we can take this uh, sound photograph, put it in our software, have Barry Humphrey sing, and it sounds like he is singing in Waitomo Caves. Down, down, down in Goblin Town. Down, down, down in Goblin Town. I'm convinced that the song will be a huge hit. He could even go platinum. <laughs> we weren't sure there was going to be an end song. We were pretty rushed. Initially, we wondered about reprising the dwarves singing Misty Mountains, and we did. We tried it. Far over the misty mountains cold. It was way too slow. And then we were thinking about, well, maybe someone else could sing it. And Fran and I were in my car. Like, the radio was on, and Neil Finn was singing. Fran was like, well, he could do it. And then I said, he really could. <laughs> do you think he would? So I actually rang him. He was in England. I got a call uh, only a matter of two weeks ago. And now I'm working on some music, which will occupy a place at the end of the movie. Far over the misty mountains cold. That brief was a reprise of the misty mountain. I just explored the melody as much as I could and tried to find my own voice for it. I brought it up in key a little. To find our long forgotten gold. Your fin was incredible. He understood the flavour and the feel of what we were going for but he needed to make it his own. It couldn't just be a reprise of the dwarf's Misty Mountains. So he came up with the lyrics and we loved them. I think the lyrics ended up being quite specifically about that moment in the story where they're perched on the rock, looking with some hope towards their ancient homeland. Oh, it was long ago when lanterns burned, but every day our hearts have yearned. The first sign of the Dwarven influence was drums turning up. It'd be good to put some brums into the 
the chorus. Yeah. Up on the stony hill, meet again. The addition of big manly percussion that would give a certain rousing dwarvish quality to it. Anvil was just obvious. They're mining folk, those dwarves. Within Erebor, there would have been the sound of mighty anvils being struck. God bless the anvil. Three, two, one! We're delighted to be asked to play the song in front of the assembled throng in Wellington for the premiere. This is for Peter, Fran and Philippa. Thank you. I think it had great heart and great spirit on the day. Far over the misty mountains rise, leave us standing upon the heights. What was before, we'll see once more, is our kingdom. A distant life. It was an epic day. People from all over the world who were just nuts for Middle Earth. So many people turned out. It was such an amazing experience. Surrounded by the people that you worked with for the last three years. We'll be there soon. I actually never thought that we would ever be lucky enough to get to work in Middle Earth again. You know, I don't even think this is the end. I can't imagine that there won't be another thing that we all come back to do. Find us, we'll know the truth. What a journey. Let me do it again. Can we start again now? I think I will miss the camaraderie the most, coming onto set every day and seeing your colleagues. I think that's a measure of what this experience has been like for people. You can have truly life-changing moments while you're here for that amount of time. This is absolutely unbelievable, everybody that's come to help us celebrate this film. You know, The Lord of the Rings was such a great experience and now we've been able to take The Hobbit and uh, it seems like fate's meant for us to be here. Yeah.